This is your host, Tim Winders. This is the place where we welcome the seekers, the goers, the creators, those folks that are making things happen. And this is really where leadership, business, ministry, all of those things come together. So thank you for joining us here. We welcome you, depending on where you're consuming or watching or listening to this, we're glad you're here. But I want to encourage you to do one thing before I get to our guest today. We really would love to continue the dialogue. In fact, we want this dialogue to continue as, as long as we can. So do a few things for us. You can go to all our socials, Seek, Go, Create. We're on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. We're also on Instagram. Now we're on Clubhouse. You could join us in all those places. And you can go to our website at seekgocreate.com. And you can find all the notes if, uh, if the podcast, where the podcast has been released, you can actually join our email list and just stay up to date on all that we're doing. So thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. And as always, we're bringing you a guest that I, your host, I'm excited to talk to. And I love just doing what I do and then flipping on this microphone, recording it so you can listen in. So welcome. Glad that you're here. Our guest today would be what I call, this is my words, not hers, an expert in human resources. She has created some tools like what's called the best HR planner on the planet. That's a great tool. Sounds like it's awesome. Uh, she has a bunch of resources, including uh, an HR resources site. Uh, the Next Gen Women on Facebook group, HR Mastermind and Coaching Programs, an HR course for government contractors, entrepreneurs, much, much more. Brenda Neckvottel, welcome to Seek Go Create. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, now I, I want to ask you one quick thing, and then I'm going to ask my first question, question, which is what you do. But in general, sometimes people aren't excited when they hear HR, but you're excited about HR, right? Yeah, I am. <laughs> All right. You're so, right. Yeah. Sometimes it, we walk away with the moniker, the Grim Reaper. I don't have that, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> All right, good. So you're going to set us straight because we got a bunch of entrepreneurs. We also have people in ministry That's and awesome. business people and leaders here that are listening in. And I don't want any of you guys, to, you guys, ladies to tune out this is important stuff. So uh, y'all have already heard Brenda. She's got the personality that's going to keep us excited about HR. So Brenda, first question I like to ask, just, you know, you and I bump into each other or you bump into one of our listeners and they say, Brenda, what do you do? What do you tell them? Yeah, absolutely. So I am actually an award-winning human resource professional. And what I do is I work with all kinds of businesses, varying sizes and individuals who are in the practitioner seat to really kind of help them sort through that overwhelm and identify solutions, viable solutions to help them address their people issues. Awesome. And, and anyone who's ever done anything in leadership or business, we shouldn't have to convince them how important people are. Right. But Brenda, I'm going to ask you to tell us how important people are. Well, people are what make your company go round and round. I mean, you you know, you can't not do anything without people. It's just as simple as that. It's just nothing can be done alone. You can't sit there and, you know, work on technology because you have to engage with people for something, you know, at the very minimum, at least IT help desk. <laughs> but, you know, you got to talk to people about, you know, you know, buying for new contracts, buying for new customers, and that's all people engagement. So. But the thing is, is that when you have a very highly engaged workforce, a workforce that is very dialed in, a workforce that knows their purpose and they know, they know the why, doesn't always mean that it's going to be rosy and beautiful. But if they know that, then you've got your business moving in the right direction. And that's what's key and important. I mean, I, even I have people that work for me. I have three. And each, every single one of them can tell you exactly what it is that I'm doing, that what we're doing, what the importance of that is, and what direction we're going in. Because people will always rise to the level of your leadership, always. Hmm. All right. So I want to, one of the things I love to do, sometimes I kind of ease into some Q&A here, but I think what I would love to do for especially for the listener out there who 
who may be in, in a position where they either have people that work with them, they work in a situation where maybe they're in an organization, or maybe they're a solopreneur or something where they're thinking that they need to start adding people. Any of those, and you could address any of them or all of them. I'd like to go for the jugular, jugular right out of the gate here, Brenda. And I would like for you to tell us with all the experience you have, what are, what's the biggest mistake? What's the biggest mess up or the biggest mistakes that, that people in those tight roles make? And, and I know specifically related to HR. Let's go ahead and hit that now. And then we're going to look at solutions as we converse and, and have our conversation. Well, so here's a good thing. So I just actually had a phone call today with a brand new client. <clears throat> I've known the guy, I've known the business owner for a long time. He's a very, very nice man. And he's a very generous individual as well. Very, but he expects a lot out of his people and likely he should, right? So he calls me up and he says, hey, listen, I'm really excited. Or at least his office manager calls me up and says, hey, I'm super excited. Um, just hired on our first part-time employee. We have two full-time, full two part-time employees. We're hiring a part-time employee. And we're going to pay him X amount of dollars and we're going to put him on salary. I said, okay, we need to talk. <laughs> and they're like, why do we need to talk? I said, first off, I said, in order for anybody to be um, a salary, be considered a salary employee, has to, you have to hit two benchmarks. And the first one is a minimum threshold of pay. And that's under the Fair Labor Standards Act. And the number that they gave me did not meet that threshold. So automatically they are a non-exempt hourly employee. I said, the other thing under FLSA is that you cannot have an hour, you can't have a part-time employee as a salaried employee unless they are an owner of the company. So this is not an owner of the company, right? So here they are thinking that, you know, like, hey, this is great. We're going to pay a person that's going to be easy. And they're doing it with the best of intentions. But had they been caught, and well, yeah, so where the big disparity comes in is not only are they violating the law unknowingly, um, but they would have also had a disparity because what would have happened if they brought in another part-time person and they paid that person hourly, but yet they were kind of doing similar work. So now you're treating people differently. And what if you had all your employees as being salaried and you have your full-time employees that are not able to work 20 hours, but yet everybody's salary, right? So there's a general rule in HR in general, and that is what you do for one, you do for all. And so you wanna be very consistent and even across the board. So doing that approach of having them, and they would never, they just simply didn't know. And that's a lot of that chaos and the confusion that I help bring to light. It's like, you know, let's get you guys doing this right out of the hopper. We're going to make this person a non-exempt employee. It means that they're hourly. Here's their hourly rate based off of what you told me. And you also have to put certain behaviors in place. That means that they can't work more than whatever hours you set. So if you're only going to have them do 20 hours, they can't work 21 hours and not get paid for it. They have to be compensated, but they also can't work more hours without your approval. Otherwise, it's theft of time. And so they're kind of, you know, like after walking through this, they're like, get it. I get it. Totally get it. And they're like, good thing we called. And I'm like, yeah, because if something went sideways, you know, that invites the Department of Labor to come in and take a look at you. And that's time and effort that you don't want. Yeah. I mean, and it could be, it could be time and effort. And like you mentioned, illegal cost. <laughs> I mean, money. it could, it could, yeah, money, all of, money. all of those <laughs> things, you know, I had, I had two or three questions that kind of popped in my mind while you were saying those things. I think, I think the first one I would like to ask is that I've, I've been a business owner, entrepreneur, solopreneur, whatever for, I did work corporate for a few years. So I, I kind of had to fit into a, a system, but I've kind of been doing my own thing now for 30 plus years. And there's a certain mindset that those people that might be owners or, 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 or whatever have, and I'm not, I'm not trying to make them better or anything than anyone else. It's just, there's a mindset of 24 seven, you know, we're doing whatever it takes. And it seems like there's just an inherent conflict that's built in, baked in when all of a sudden someone like me says, I want to hire someone either part-time, full-time. And I'm almost throwing you a softball here, but 
we almost need someone like you to tell us to kind of keep us from really screwing up. What are your thoughts? I mean, am I, am I off base there? No, no, no. Cause you know, the company I was just talking about, they already, they only have two full-time employees, Yeah. you know, well, that's not true. They have three full-time and then this is their part-time, but they wouldn't know. I mean, they're just doing what they think is right. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but in it, in and of itself, but you know, the, there's, there's a lot of ways that I would much rather spend money uh, on other things in the company other than, you know, realizing that that mistake just cost me a couple thousand dollars. Or mm -hmm. let's say, for example, you have somebody that files a discrimination claim against your organization, but never does anything with it, right? They file it, they make a bunch of mess, it's a conversation and it's, you know, attorneys and everything, and it never goes forward for five months. Well, that's five months of attorney fees that I can think of that I would much rather put somewhere else in my company rather than having to pay an attorney for something that never came to fruition. And that's a lot of what can happen too. And it, it's a resource suck is what it is. And, you know, even, even if it's not with somebody like me. So a matter of fact, I was on, um, I've been in rooms with uh, a gentleman by the name of Alex Stern. And Alec is the, one of the co-founders of Constant Contact. And we've been in rooms over in Clubhouse together. And Alec is an awesome guy. And uh, he and I actually had a Zoom call earlier today about something specific. And one of the great, 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 great solutions that he came up with for a fast growing uh, organization, bringing in a lot of people really quick is to actually bring in a PEO, which is actually a partner employment organization that comes with an HR person that will already has the tools and the materials to help build a company up from the start. And eventually you can bring in an HR person. Now, does that make sense for an organization who only has two, maybe three people? Is it gonna be a slower growth? No, it doesn't. Because what usually comes with a PEO is a long-term agreement. And the company that you hire as a PEO they got skin in the game. So if you guys don't see eye to eye, and that's the downside of the PEO, is that if you don't agree on how to proceed on either firing or not firing somebody or writing them up or not writing them up or disciplining them or not disciplining or offering this package versus not, you've got a partnership. It's a, it's a legal binding partnership. And if they don't agree with it, you, you're going to be spending a lot of time <laughs> pulling your hair out and really wishing you didn't go down that PEO route. Um, so, you know, when you move forward into either bringing somebody like me in who can help teach a company how to do HR or bringing in an organization that will do it as a PEO, you really kind of have to have the big picture in mind. And what's your strategy? What's the real reason why you're going to do this? And you have to remember that HR is very important to an organization for a wide variety of reasons. But if you start as an, as an entrepreneur and you it, build it into your mind that HR has a seat at the table with you, the part of your executive leadership team or whatever it is that you come up with, you're going to be way far ahead in the game than a lot of other small businesses. And we bring us, we bring, we have the ability to bring a strategic competitive advantage to the company. Yeah. And I think in the environment we're in, it's, it's the reason why many of us exist, but sometimes we spend the least amount of time, energy, and effort on it. And some of us, we even get irritated when people like you bring up certain things to us. I do, I do want to pause though. I'm, I'm real cautious about acronyms and you brought up PEO and I'm guessing that's a personnel executive officer, but correct me on that and tell people what that is if I'm wrong. <laughs> no, that's okay. I, I mentioned it is called a paid it is a hey. partner employment opportunity. Ah, okay. Sorry. I right. actually missed or that. Partner My bad. employment operation or, or you know, it, it has its own thing, but it is partner employment. And it's with Thank a, you. it's with an uh, no, you're welcome. It's with an external company. Um, they do the payroll. And the thing is, is that um, the employees are not filed with the IRS under your company. They're filed under the PEO's uh, EIN. I, that's right, typically right. how it works yeah 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 actually I, I actually missed that term there so thank you for clarifying yeah, that okay. and helping me and uh and and bringing that up i there was a couple of things that i wanted to do here but you know what i would like to do first 
I would like for you to, we are, we're recording this in, you know, mid, mid winter 2021. We've just had an incredibly interesting last 12 months. Some people may be listening, listening this on into the spring of 2021, but work from home, uh, you know, all of these other variables, you know, COVID and all of these other things that, that maybe some people saw it coming, maybe they didn't, I don't know. Um, I've always been a nomad. My actual, my wife worked for a Silicon Valley company for four years and we traveled and there was some, there was some great things about that. There was also some challenges about that, but all of a sudden everyone went work from home in March, April, May, some companies even longer. Can you talk about and educate us, give us some wisdom about, about some of the, some of the cons, the challenges, and maybe some of the pros, I guess, about yeah. all that went on around COVID and work and HR and leadership yeah. and employment, all of those things. Just talk to us about that. Yeah, absolutely. So I will start off as one of the cons is uh, a lot of the distractions. So I, and when I turned around, I realized that my nine and a half month old puppy has now uh, taken my shoe. So uh, that pair is gone and done and and you'll see him he'll be popping up over here he's hanging out there he is that pathway of destruction and you know <laughs> what it's his favorite thing to do is to chew on cardboard plastic and paper Nicole. yeah <laughs> right so we all deal with this stuff right so is that a is that a pro or a con though i mean come on you're hanging really out at home both. i mean it's definitely entertainment that's for sure so there it is there's that shoes totally yeah gone. that's a good visual beautiful Thank you. <laughs> well we've, and we've already and we've already talked you're seeing me in in the passenger seat of my rv so yeah. <laughs> so we're providing some great examples of either what to do or not to do we're not sure yet so <laughs> so all right good good start there he's, he's notorious and he may happen it's uh he's notorious for jumping up and coming up behind me when he's got to go out so all of a sudden i'll be in a meeting and, and you just see this head and he's so big I and mean, he's like nine and a half months right but he's a great pyrenees so he, all of a sudden you see this like yeti that just kind of comes up out of behind out of nowhere and that's when i know it's like oh well we gotta wrap this up because somebody's gotta go outside <laughs> well as I, I'm, I'm sitting here recording these you know and we're recording and trying to be you know as pseudo professional as we possibly can on all these zoom calls and everything and then but all of a happens. sudden yeah, all of a sudden, someone, the place we're at here in southern Utah, there's a lot of people with ATVs. There's also some guy around afternoon decides he needs to crank up the blower and blow everything off. And, <laughs> you know, it's just kind of like, hey, it is what it is. So, Part of it. yeah, it is. You know, I think everybody can relate to that. So, all right. So those are some kind of fun, jovial things. What else about the last 12 months that have been interesting, intriguing, challenging? Yeah, so I think, so first off, what I find very intriguing a lot about the last 12 months is that we've seen businesses figure things out faster. And I think the businesses that have moved fast are the ones that are actually doing the best, right? Um, there's a lot of companies out there that waited several months until they're like, well, you know, we'll hang off and just see you know, do we reopen? And it's just like, no, it, there's, there's no way we're going to be opening anytime soon. And, you know, that hesitation, when you're in business, you have to make fast decisions. And sometimes you have to do that in HR. But the difference between a business, somebody who's in business and somebody who's in HR is that somebody in business can make a decision with as little as maybe about 40%, right? 50%, 60%. In HR, we can't do that. We have, if we make a decision with not enough information, we actually open the company up for risk. So that's why we have to be extremely thorough. We have to understand, okay, Mr. Something or other, whoever you are, why did you feel it was necessary to put your hand on a female where it didn't belong? You know, what's, there's more to the story to that. We know that. So we have to go into that. It's like, oh, well, we've been actually dating for, you know, 16 months. I'm like, really? We didn't know that. So come back to the female employees. Like, so I understand that you've been dating for 16 months. Yeah, well, we broke up last week. This really isn't that much of a sexual harassment case. If that's, you know, it's like you have to go into those details. Says so we were to terminate him and not know that information. And this is very loose examples, right? Sure. But if we were to make a decision based off of 
you know, one report, we would have found out that that was an egregious error on behalf of the employer, right? So we can't make decisions like that. But with COVID and what's going on, it means that we have to be even more cognizant of detail. And we actually have to think even more critically, I think both as a company and as both in HR. Um, one of the things that what happened at the beginning of the pandemic was a couple of things actually. First off, IT packages, IT was not ready for this. And so companies found massive delays and trying to figure out, well, how do we get the information to the employees in order for them to do their job? Huge expenses, right? So that puts a drain on the organization. But it also demonstrated to employers that you can do it and you can still run a company with your employees working from home. As a matter of fact, you probably saved some money in the long run, right? So, so there's the up and down kind of thing. A lot of employers get really nervous about employees working from home because they think I'm going to get screwed. You know, work's not going to get done. You know, employees are going to start goofing off. They're going to go run out and, and do lunch. And you know what? There's some of that out there. Yeah, absolutely. It exists, you know, acknowledge it, <clears throat> coach to it, lead it and develop it. But you know what, if you don't have the right culture in place and if you don't have the right people in place with those values that you can trust them or um, that you teach them how to work autonomously by setting the expectations and reinforcing them on a, a consistent basis, then you're always going to be into that cat in a room full of rocking chair scenario, right? But you can't, you can't lead a business if you're worried about all the time if somebody is going to steal from you or all the time bad stuff is going to happen. Because you, number one, you're putting the wrong juju out there. And number two, everybody's going to pick up on it. And that's not going to build trust, right? So you have to, I think now people really had to build trust more so than anything. And the tighter you squeeze, the more stuff comes through your fingertips. And I think it's forced good leaders, even good leaders, really, to open up that aperture. I know it's forced me to do it um, and to come up with unique ways of, of doing business in a new way. And thankfully, it worked, right? I was, I, I've always been ahead of all of this. And gosh, man, by, by the time April rolled through, between March and April, because I was already jumping up and down on this with my some of my, so I get contracted to do um, educational webinars with different companies, and I was jumping up and down. I'm like, guys, we got to get on top of this. Like, well, you know, the, it, we still need you know 30 to 45 days to schedule. And I said, no, you don't. You need to do it in two weeks. <laughs> in 11 days, we need to be talking about this. And I, you know, was on it. And sure enough, we did. And by the time the end of April came, I had spoken to 3,500 companies about the coronavirus and the new Family First Coronavirus Response Act, which had the emergency paid leave in the, in the EFMLA, right? I was exhausted. I mean, 3,500 companies, that's all. I mean, I had 500 people on webinars at one time. And it was crazy because nobody knew what to do. And this is what I do. I'm a crisis person. Like we do this, 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 and this, here's the information. And every time I got ahead of the information that I knew nobody else had, give me three days. And now that was old deal. It was, it was crazy, you know? So it's also opened up challenges. Actually, this, this information started coming out this week, this past week, actually. So Yes, we did have people that, you know, had to shut down. Yes, we have employees that had to go out on leave and or go out on a, a, lay, a layoff or a furlough. What it also has created because of mass volume, this happens in an economic downturn. And this does nothing to help this relationship that we were talking about between employee and employer. This does absolutely nothing to help it. It actually hinders it in the eyes, I think, in the eyes of the employer. But what's coming out is that there's massive amounts of unemployment fraud that is now taking place, California specifically. 11, are you ready for this number? $11.4 billion that California has now reported in unemployment fraud. In addition to that, they are preparing to announce either, it's either another 20 billion or it has crept up to 20 billion in their investigation. Washington state, same situation, not as high of a number, but they're having issues, Colorado and Illinois. 
So now we're seeing massive billions. And what that does is that it also means that now we can challenge, is our unemployment really sitting at 6.7% or is it really kind of closer to 4.5? Because that number comes from the unemployment claims. So how can you build trust in a world where it's very clearly people can't be trusted? So these are some serious dichotomies that we're actually having to figure out and go through. And the only way you can do that is it goes back to what I said before. People will rise to the level of your leadership. Leadership comes in now more so than ever before. And if you well, have that talent, you got to deal with it. Yeah, that's that's so interesting because the the data you just gave at the time of us recording this here in early February, that that plays into such the political divide, which is an issue. And I don't care which side you're on, but if you all of a yep. sudden talk about a lot of fraud and you've got business people, you've got people trusting the numbers of unemployment, and you've got political leaders, some wanting to give more, some trying to give less. It just, it, that doesn't help at all. And one of the things you just mentioned, I want to bring it up because it came up in a recent interview I did. Someone was talking about the need for leaders to empower the people that they work with. And, and you kind of brought this up. You said that a lot of leaders like, they don't like letting people work from home because they lose control. And control to me is the off opposite of empower. <laughs> and exactly. And so it's kind of like we, we almost are going to begin reaping what we've sown. If we've had the culture of empowerment, then I think we may see good transitions. I, I work with a few clients that were in that, that role, and you probably have some great examples too. But, but then others, like you said, that operate with the clenched fist, they're probably going to have trouble. And so yeah. that, was, uh, that was excellent. You talked about trust there. I did have... Related to that, I'm actually going to get, I'm going to get your help on uh, a client that I'm working with right here. How about that? Oh, yeah, it'll absolutely. Help, it'll help others. I've got a client, let's just, I, I won't give exact numbers, but let's just say 30 employees. And we were very quick. I actually started working with them right as the pandemic started. Very quick to say work from home. Mm -hmm. And, and, but what, what we started doing is November, December, we started having conversations about what it looks like to start bringing some people back into the office. And they had a few that trickled in. They're kind of in a socially distanced type office anyway, but there's right. also challenges to even saying that people can come back because some people think that means we're supposed to come back. And anyway, the, the language it's is all force. And the only image that they have in their head is what the past used to look like. Yeah. Yeah, so so I, I believe that there are a lot of organizations, small, large, super large, that are wrestling with those conversations right now. Brenda, could you walk us through just a little bit of that decision-making process on what and how to do that? And at the time we're recording yes. this, they're attempting to get vaccines out. They're attempting to, you know, I think some numbers might be going down after some spikes in January. I don't know. We don't know what will happen when people are listening, but talk us through some of that with your expertise that you have. That would be very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. So first and foremost, if any company is looking at how do we bring people back in, they have to follow the guidance and the advice of their local health department. That's first and foremost. Um, local health departments aren't always... 100% and completely in alignment with the CDC. They do take their guidance and their recommendations, but sometimes they actually implement a little bit more um, and a little extra based off of, you know, the COVID cases and claims that are in, in their regional area, right? And how that happens. So you have to know what is required at the local level. You have to know what the states are doing as well. Um, some states are actually starting to implement um, mandatory paid sick leave as a whole, as in, in general. Um, this has certainly motivated that to happen. Sorry. Our current president is also very motivated to make that happen at the federal level as well. So, um, you know, you have to really pay attention to what everybody is starting to say. OSHA in the EEOC, um, OSHA has been directed by the president in an executive order to create more guidance for employers to almost guarantee or ensure, which is, I don't even see how that's possible, 
um, that employers have employees have a safe workplace. And there's another executive order that has been sent out that the DOL is, I think, probably grappling with. And there's how do you mandate or make a regulation that an employee actually has the option to not work if they feel that their health is in jeopardy. So this is all in flux right now, right? We don't, and we don't even know what that means. We don't know, we don't know do they need a doctor's note for it? Um, <clears throat> you know, we have no context of this whatsoever. And that's what the government does. The government is great at saying, okay, we're gonna do this. And then we figure it out later and then it gets litigated. And that's, and that's how we get our best practices from it. So there's that. Um, at this point, I don't even think that anybody can take into consideration the cultural aspect of returning people to work as a benefit because, you know, we're, we're, we're numerically, we're beyond the pandemic numbers. You know, this is an, this is endemic, you know, we're, just, we're, we're beyond that threshold of even calling it a pandemic anymore. It's just a full worldwide endemic. So, um, I wish you could bring your dog to work day. Yeah, we, we hear, well, you know, I don't know if that, does that mean agreement? Does that mean that we're, I, you know, we're getting no some idea. rebuttal? <laughs> <laughs> that means there's something going on that I need to pay attention to probably, but. Okay, well, if someone's barging in, let us know if we need to do a policy. Yeah, here, I know, but... you'll, you'll know it. They'll be all over it. But um, so those are the things that actually need to take place. Um, and, you know, then you have to look at policy. Um, you know, how does that work? And is your company wanting to mandate the vaccine? And that's a very touchy area. That's a very, yeah. very touchy area. Yeah. Tell, tell me about that because, okay. because there's real balance here and we're kind of, like you mentioned, we're going down some interesting paths because for the longest, and I think this is all still in place. You tell me if I'm right or wrong, that there is privacy related to medical issues, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what one does, all that type stuff. And then if a business or an organization says, you know, you can't walk through these doors unless you can prove that you've had, you know, you're immune, you've had the vaccine or anything yeah. like that. I mean, aren't, boy, aren't we opening up a whole new, I'll, this is a technical term, can of worms. Can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are. So um, as it sits right now, and I do not recommend anybody, you cannot hold me to this. Absolutely not. I'm not an attorney. I'm just someone who understands how all this works. But as it sits right now at the federal level, the question is, can you mandate a vaccine and can you terminate somebody if they don't take it? The answer is, yeah, you can in general, but it is layered, layered with a lot of complexity and a lot of challenges. So first off, your policies cannot violate uh, religious and uh, disabilities exemptions, right? So you have to carve out exemptions for people. There's some religions out there that don't permit certain things to happen. You know, you can't, like Jehovah's Witness, they don't allow people to get blood transfusions, right? You could have somebody has a massive, massive car accident. And if the family member says, no, no blood trans transfusion, they lost a lot of blood. That is a long road to hoe to get better. So they won't permit that, right? That's just one example. Um, and actually, it was a case that recently came out. I can't remember exactly where it was, but it was a fire department, um, a fire fireman who uh, was an ordained minister. And there's a um, there's a four letter acronym. I'm not going to even attempt the acronym because I can't remember it exactly. But it also it also is required as part of the part of the function of the role, right? So if it's job related and you got people like firemen, EMS, they deal with things like blood borne pathogens. They deal with, you know, uh, all sorts of other types of bodily fluids. Oh my gosh. Oh. <laughs> Nine and a half months. I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> Usually yeah. I'm the guy with the noises with my RV here. So oh, word. man, I that's know. beautiful. Just, thank you. He's just a bull in a china <laughs> shop. We're going to leave all this in too, because I'm going to use this as an example. <laughs> we're speaking to the HR professional <laughs> yes. and we're going to, <laughs> and, and we've got the, the interruptions of the dog issue. So anyway, all right. Excellent. So, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so you, so in this case, uh, the fire, the fire department came back with, well, you know, we've got two accommodations for you. One accommodation is that we can move you to another 
uh, position, same pay, same benefits. And the other combination is that you will be required to wear a respirator 100% of the time. The employee came back and said, well, I don't want to move to the other position. I'm not going to move to the other position. What about if I wear a respirator anytime I'm around somebody who's got, who has a known, um, uh, a, a known condition where they're susceptible by breathing in foreign body and, and you know, their immune system is depleted or something very similar to that. And so the fire department said, no. And so he says, well, I'm not, I don't want to move to the other. He says, I don't want, I'm not moving. I'm not choosing to move to the other job. So they terminated him. And um, so he took him to court <clears throat> and said that he was, as, uh, that he attempted to prove, and that's a very big phrase that I'm using there, uh, based off of a genuine religious belief that he was discriminated against because of religion and having to take this vaccine, which was required as part of the job. And the other piece was, is that he was also retaliated against because he filed, um, and he filed the request for the accommodation. Well, the court initially um, ruled and then it wound up going to an appeal. So it ruled against him and then it went into the appellate court. The appellate court actually supported it that the chief and the fire department were completely correct. They, they gave the employee a reasonable accommodation, which I absolutely thought that was reasonable. He opted not to take it. And the reason why he didn't take it was because in taking so would have disrupted his ability to manage another business, which was in construction. So the lesson learned there is that just because it's an, a preference, it doesn't meet an employee's preference, doesn't mean it's not an accommodation, right? So now right. this case, in my opinion, really sets some groundwork <clears throat> for employers who are really wrestling with this uh, mandated vaccine because it recently establishes exactly what I just said. And the fact that he lost also on the retaliation was because he, there was no causality. He couldn't prove causality behind it. So he's out, right? And the fire chief actually was, and there was also a, a claim against the fire chief in specific because there is such thing as individual liability. So an employee can actually go after you as an individual because the fire chief made the correct decision. They conducted the appropriate investigation. They had the right legal strategy in place. The fire chief also was not negatively impacted by this as well. Okay, so that takes us into um, what's going on with COVID. If you don't do all of that due, due diligence, and we have really nothing, a lot to go on here, um, it has to, you know, mandating vaccines, in my opinion, really have to align with the nature of the job. But our president is going to confuse that because he's putting pressure on OSHA to put more preventions and more cautions into work so that people can not everybody is wanting to do this vaccine. There's a lot that we don't know about it. And I guarantee you that this year alone, it's going to get litigated. And then it's going to be litigated for the next five years because somebody's going to have some sort of side effect that took it. And now we're going to see billboards of, you know, like class action lawsuit. Like if you've taken this, you know, Johnson and Johnson or whatever, or Pfizer's, yeah. you know, first round of COVID vaccines and, you know, you have a tumor that's sticking off the side of your face. That's, you know, the size of, you know, half of a hockey stick, then you may have a case, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? So we're probably going to, we're, we're going to see stuff like that. Yeah. I think, and it's such no a dividing, yeah, no easy answer. And so, and here's my, th this is like totally a wimpy, wimpy issue. I don't do needles. <laughs> So, but they, there's a lot of people that don't do needles. So I don't do needles and I don't really put anything in my body that I don't really truly understand. And yeah. so that is going, you know, and I'm, I, you know, I'm sitting here wondering if they're going to try to say you can't fly. And uh, so I'm thankful. That would be the same problem. Yeah. I, I don't see them doing that. I can't see them doing that. Um, yeah. And not to mention the vaccine does not a hundred percent protection. Yeah, it's not. And even if you do get the vaccine, you still have to wear your, your protective garb. You still have to wear a face mask because you can still transfer it to somebody else. Yeah. So, so these are odd, that problem hasn't been solved. These are odd times we're in. And so Very. people like you become extremely valuable. And Brenda, I want to I want to actually in just a moment ask about some of the resources you have, because yeah. if nothing else, the conversation we're having is highlighting to leader that's listening or non-leader saying, oh boy, 
we need some HR help probably. But yes. the, the, before I do that, I like to ask some kind of origin type story. How, sure. does one, how does one end up in HR? How does Brenda decide five years old, 10 years old, whatever, whatever age, I'm going to be an HR professional and provide all these resources and tools for people that, uh, that need them and be a person you mentioned earlier, someone that deals with the crisis that can yeah. come with this type thing. How does that happen? Well, I got to be honest with you at five years old, I wanted to be Wonder Woman and a dolphin trainer. So I can guarantee you that I was not thinking HR at that time of my life. I'll just well, put that to bed right let now. Let me just tell you, if you were Wonder Woman and a dolphin trainer, I would still be interviewing you right now. In fact, I'd be tracking you down to interview you. <laughs> oh my gosh. No. Um, so it actually started, um, you know, I was really good at the function, uh, you know, the making sure that the employee files were good. And, you know, that was through my earlier management years. And then I took a break for like six months. A uh, company I was working for was closing down. I was burnt out. I was not a very good leader at the time, but I was very capable of um, managing a group of people and improving performance in a company. And that's, that's what I did. They would, I'm always the one that they send in to fix the broken stuff. But now I, you know, I didn't, I never had a good leader. So I went to a, my third Fortune 500 company that I worked for and worked with my very favorite boss of all time. His name is Tom. And Tom was very direct with me. He's like, look, he's like, you, he says, you know how to make our customers feel really good. When it comes to working with employees, you are, you've got some hard edges on you. And I, but I told him, I said, you know, I'm really liking this HR gig. And, um, you know, I, applied for the internal position and I got it when it came open, tried for it five times with another stores throughout the organization, didn't get it, but got in with him because he saw the potential. And the only reason why I didn't get it in the other stores is that because they weren't interested in moving uh, a person at that low level around the company. They didn't want to put the expense in for it, but I got it at my own store when it came available. So we worked together for a while and I told him, I said, I really like this. I like this a lot. I like I like being able to sort through the people issues. I like being able to apply business methodology. And he, and I said, I'm going to go back to school for it. And he says, you don't have to go back to school. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you do. <laughs> and uh, I said, yeah, you really do. Long story short, that's how it got kicked off is that once I was in the seat, but the cool part was, is I was already doing it. And when I went and I got my degree, I had already had the practical experience. I just didn't know the theology behind it. So I was always able to break things down. I was able to apply practices that our company was using in my, in my coursework <laughs> because, um, you know, I just, I've had the experience and I could say, I couldn't say why we didn't do it, but I could tell you how we did it. And, and, you know, I could review the policy and I understood the policy and I could regurgitate that a little bit, but I could never understand the reason behind it. And so that's when I started uh, doing all the research and the study based off of the court cases and, uh, you know, all the other company case studies of failures and successes. That's really when I was able to put to and it was like, oh, that's how you do it. And then my world learned got flipped upside down again when I worked for ADP for five years and I found myself in the government contracting space. And that's a whole different beast in and of itself. So. Wow. So, um, so then how long would you say you have been an HR professional? How long have you been in that specific niche, that, that business? Um, collectively, I'd say over 22 years. Wow. Okay. So yeah. with all of that, you have, uh, cause when I go to your site and look around, I see just a lot of resources. And I, I did a quick blurb when we introed you, but I'm actually going to allow you now to speak about that because if, if nothing else, this conversation should let someone know who is in, in a role of any type responsibility that they need someone like you, or, or at least some of the resources you have. And I, I specifically was intrigued by the planner. So, um, so, so why don't you, well, because listen, yes. we need a list, we need reminders. Uh, oh, so you got, oh, cool. Got it right here. Very yeah, good. Go so, so why don't you, you go ahead right now. I'm just going to allow you to, you know, we've got leaders, we've got people in ministry, we've got, we've got entrepreneurs, we've got a wide range of people. Tell us 
what all you have available in just a little while I'll, I'll before we wrap i'll tell i'll ask you to you know give exact how people can connect with you but right now just go through some of the resources you have and why people or what type of person might need to reach out and get that resource yeah no problem so usually i work on, on the individual level um, i work with people who are in their early to mid level of their hr careers right they're figuring this stuff out and so I actually created the best HR planner on the planet, as you see here. And uh, what this is, is it is a it's 60 pages of really good information. It talks about where you start. It actually has a listing of uh, several pages long of what does an employee, what does an HR professional actually do? Talks about skills and abilities, the actual job function itself, the education, as you can see, it's several pages long. There you go. Um, and it distinguishes the difference between an HR specialist or generalist and, a, and an actual man, man, a, a manager. And then it goes into what laws do I have to follow based off of the company size up here. So it'll have a check mark at this particular law you have to follow <clears throat> all the way over till you are 100 and up. I'm trying to figure out what he's eating next. And then there's some information down here. So if you're a government contractor, it talks about the different uh, other types of uh, requirements that you need to uh, adhere to. There's an advertisement on the podcast that I have out there, which just got picked up by iHeartRadio today. Oh, and congratulations. Uh, thank Excellent. you very much. Yeah, we're streaming on iHeart now, which I'm really excited. And then it has a list of uh, 12 months and a high level overview of all of the deadlines that from a compliance standpoint need to be met. Then it has an actual 12 month calendar. You can see I'm even writing it because I use it too, right? An actual 12 month planner with tips and tasks and other kind of reminders throughout the month <clears throat> that correlate with that, uh, with that um, compliance calendar as a list of all of the holidays that need to be, uh, that you can find. It has some information about the coaching program and this is one of the biggest ones. It has a year on checklist that starts in October on how you actually close out and launch a new year. Then it has a list of all of the various laws. There's a hidden web, there's a hidden link or a hidden page on my website that you can connect and actually click on the link and get sent directly to the law. We got a couple, we got about three little quick lessons of things that you can learn uh, that what you need to do. There's a section for notes where you can take notes throughout the year. And that's that. And it is, it is, we've already sold out of the first, uh, the first printing run of it, which is wow. really great. Now is that, is the creation that. of that, because listen, everybody loves checklists, everybody loves tools, everybody loves, you know, planners. Is that for, I mean, you mentioned kind of that, that person that would be interested in that. Is that for, for anyone to go get that? I mean, you say you're sold out, so it might be tough to get right now, but. Oh, no, but, no, we have, we're in, we have, we have planners in stock. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Then very good. So, yeah. um, all right. So you mentioned a few other things, because being a coach myself, I know how valuable a coach is. Sounds like you also have that. Just go ahead, briefly mention the other resources you have available. Yeah. And then maybe we'll, we've got a few more things I want to ask, and then we'll start. We're going to start our landing. We're kind of heading towards the yeah. landing here. Yeah, no problem. So I do have a resource site you mentioned it earlier. Um, it is, it is a great place to go. Probably the biggest thing that I've built up on it this year <clears throat> is that it has over 60 different feed uh, employment news feeds piped in and it covers COVID updates. It covers workers' compensation updates. It covers OSHA and safety, government contracting, unionization, and it also has almost for almost all 50 states state specific feed information that's coming in. So you literally get about like 100 different articles that are accessible every day through 60 different resources, if not a little bit more. Um, and it also has uh, downloadable tools that we've put up. Like, um, for instance, there's an employment uh, law firm that actually has a leave tracker app that you can actually link to. So it's a nice repository of self-service and different types of resources that are outside of our, of our regulatory, um, our regulatory organization, which is the Society of Human Resource Management. 
And so those things is if there's some videos and but and and also case law. So anytime we get a, you know, a new landmark case that's coming in, we put that stuff up there. So that way people can go in because if you read the summaries, that's how you learn. And so um, it's very, very affordable. We keep it, it, it's actually cost less for the entire month than spending three cups of coffee a week. Priceless. <laughs> Some, and we keep it low coffee. on purpose so that people can access it. Some of that coffee is getting pricey, but I get, I know, I know the point there. And, you know, here's the deal with it. I think this is something important. I think there's foundational principles, but none of this stuff is static, right? This no. is a continual, I mean, it, it's literally impossible for, you know, Joe or Sally business owner, business person mm -hmm. to keep up with this stuff. Is that it's, correct? It's a full-time job for somebody like me to keep up with it. And so that's the reason why we actually created the HR um, strategy and compliance um, mastermind as well. And we take you literally soup to nuts through an entire year based off of a lot of information here on how to actually do the function of HR, just from an entry level perspective. What do, what do you need to know? How do you go about doing it? Here's the reason why it gets done this way. We have weekly Q and A's, it's a great program. Uh, but it's a 12 month commitment. And then we actually have a 12 month coaching program where I, or a mentoring program where I actually get to mentor people for a whole year and we go deep. Wow. Wow. Excellent. I can see a lot of value in that. You know, I, I started off asking for some mistakes. I think the way I would like to wrap up here before we just do a couple of quick questions to finalize, I would like for you to give a few I don't even know if best practices would be the right word, just some wisdom, just, just share maybe encouragement. I don't know. I don't know what the right thing is. I just want to give you a little bit of time here to maybe yeah. speak directly to that leader, business person, minister, whatever, and just say, Hey, listen, here's a few things to do. And, and, and I know a lot of it is maybe go back to the resources, but just a few tips that would be helpful and to nourish the people out there that might from this conversation go, Oh no, one more thing to be concerned about. One I, I more guess thing to encourage us. On. Yeah, encourage us with a few little with a few maybe good tips or story or something <laughs> just as we yeah. wrap up. Absolutely. So I'm gonna give you my rules of HR. How's that? Ooh, so nice. my number my number one live and die rule in life is in the absence of information, people make stuff up. When we don't know anything as a human being. And we have to justify what we don't know. We make up a story in our head and it's a very natural organic thing to do because we don't like ambiguity, but understand that <clears throat> there's a lot of assumption when you're dealing with employee issues and you have to really get concrete, significant, definitive information as much as you possibly can. My number one rule in HR is that what you do for one, you do for all. And that's very, very important. You have to judge and evaluate everything uh, that happens in your organization. My number two rule in HR is that the same body of government that tells you to be compliant with the law is the same body of government that's actually going to put you in a position to violate it. And we're really going to see that here in, the, in this year. Okay. Now, rule number three in HR is to be consistent, be either consistently good or consistently bad. Just don't be inconsistently good or inconsistently bad. And it's what really invites agencies, lawyers, and auditors to really dig deep into your practices. Uh, my fourth rule in HR is that you're never too small to be caught. And even if you're not doing anything intentionally, that'll be there. And my last and number fifth rule in HR is that there's always two sides to every story and the truth always lies in between in the middle somewhere that you, you know what i almost didn't ask that question i am so thankful that i did because there was so much value in all of that <laughs> so i appreciate it brenda how can people connect with you how would you want them to find you get in touch with you and uh and get whatever resources or anything like that share we'll we'll include it in the notes and okay. in any links and things like that but let us know how people can find you absolutely so you can find me on my website at brenda the hr lady.com uh, you can also find me on just about every social channel that's out there uh brenda the hr lady uh, you can find me on linkedin just by name which is brenda neck bottle you can see it spelled out right there not down at the bottom, any CK, like the thing you want to choke, he is in Victor, A-T-A-L. Uh, you can tune into the podcast. We're on 13 different channels. Like I said, we just got onto High Heart Radio, which is 
the best is called the best practices in human resources podcast. Um, it's an awesome show. You'll hear Mark on there actually twice, to be honest with you. And um, in, in matter of fact, if you go into Clubhouse, I'm starting to do daily shows at 10 and 11 a.m. roughly. We're still working out some scheduling. But um, if you look at my pod in my in my profile, you can text me as well. And the texting information will go up on the website, but you can even just set up a 15 minute call if you wanna ask questions or just kind of get a feel on how I might be able to either point you in the right direction if I don't know the answer or help you figure out, you know, your most difficult people problems. Yeah, that's that's excellent. At the time of this, of this recording, I'm enjoying Clubhouse, how about you? Oh, I love it. Oh, I love it. Oh my gosh. I love being up there. I love being on Clubhouse. Are you spending it, too are you spending too much time on it though? Let go ahead no, and be honest. I'm very disciplined. I'm very intentional okay. with everything that I do. And so, except maybe one thing in life, but that's okay. Um, everything else I do is intentional. And so when I so I avoid spending a lot of time on Clubhouse on purpose because yes, I'll get burnt out on it, but I have other things to do. And, and I love the conversation. You know, I'm much better behind yeah. the mic. I don't do the videos on Instagram or TikTok or anything. I'm not that good on video. I'm better behind the mic. And yeah. uh, that comes from years of consulting over the phone. So love Clubhouse. Um, and, you know, anytime the room is available that it's open, we're starting to be a participant in a group called um, Biz, uh, Biz, uh, Business Problem Solvers. And Alec Stern, uh, who is the co-founder of uh, Constant Contact, uh, actually is the one who is really kind of leading that up with a, a couple other people. And so they're, they're now bringing me up and I've made, I think I've made the moderator cut now. So it'll be, it'll be pretty awesome. And so, so there's a lot of really good information that we put out, spend a lot of time with government contractors as well. So it's fun. Oh my gosh. And the, commu and, and the people that I've networked with so far, are just amazing. I, uh, I'm enjoying it too. And, you know, here, you know, we just actually earlier said, whatever you do for one, do for all. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the time of recording this, it's only for people on iPhones. <laughs> so yes. we, we, we've just, but that we've, just coming. we've just talked about something that excludes quite a bit of the population. And yeah. I do think they're just a few months off from saying that. And when that happens, boy, so there's going to be people piling in. We'll get all those Android users piling in and mixing in with all the iPhone folks. Well, yeah. Brenda, I've, I've so enjoyed our conversation. And uh, the last question that I like to ask, we are seek, go create those three words. Mm -hmm. Which one of those words jumps out at you over the other two when I say seek, go create? Create. And why? It's, that's what I do. I just constantly, like I have these ideas and it's like, ooh, that would help that. Ooh, that would help that. If you've got something out there that you know is going to help somebody, right? Or you know is going to help a group of people. Like, so I, that's actually how I started. This, I started off with the HR resource website and it was meant to be like a group community site. Nobody liked that part, but there are other elements that they liked. Then I recognized that there was a need to have consistent, edu you know, consistent HR news coming in with all the changes. So if there's something that you can create that can benefit people, they're looking for it right now. And a lot of people need all the help that they can get. So if there's something that you that can help change something for the better for somebody, get it out there. Wow, that is excellent. Brenda, thank you so much for sharing with us. Yeah, I've, thank you. I've enjoyed the conversation. If you've listened in, I encourage you, like I said at the beginning, to continue this dialogue. If you've watched this on one of the socials or seen it on one of the social channels, just go down, make a comment. I may even, if it's, if it's technical, I'll say, Hey, listen, Brenda, can you jump back in and answer or at least connect you? And, and, uh, and if you've listened to this on the podcast or anything else, please, 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 please just continue the dialogue. And as I said earlier, the best place to do that is really go to seekgocreate.com and make sure we've got your best email address because that's how we keep you up to date on things and just have all kinds of fun. And remember every Monday, we have a new episode next Monday. It'll be an awesome one. So make sure you're listening in there. Thank you so much for joining us and remember to continue being all that you were created to be. We'll talk to you again soon.